Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Discovery Channel. This is Tom O'Connor from hot and humid New Orleans, Louisiana. We, we are eagerly awaiting several events at the moment. We have not one, but two uh, tropical depressions brewing out in the Atlantic. There's one that's just hitting the Windward Islands right now and a, another one coming off the coast of uh, Africa. So it is full tilt hurricane season, but even more important, we're waiting for the release this morning of the lineup for the October delayed Jazz Fest uh, festivities. And I put those two together because of course, uh, we will have that only if uh, the weather cooperates with us. So, um, and as we like to say down here, uh, in the words of that uh, preeminent meteorologist, James W. Buffett, there ain't no reason with hurricane season. Uh, I am joined as always by um, <laughs> Rocky Messing, who's, who's apparently now because of his geographic proximity to the new uh, prime minister of, of Israel as part of the kitchen cabinet. Um, and, yes, and I, have, <laughs> I have locked down in my house. I, I, uh, I, I, I don't know if they're, they're worried about COVID or they're worried about something else, but uh, yeah, it's, it's loads of fun over here. I, I live five doors away from the prime minister, so right. it makes right. sense. <laughs> so you're in, in British terms, you're at like number 15 Downing Street, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Can you hand notes out to the, the, the <laughs> do they call them secret service? Or do you just guys use the army for protection? Uh, the Shabak. Shabak. So it's a, it's yeah, a, it it's, is a specific entity though? It, it's, yeah, the Israeli uh, secret service basically, wow. or intelligence. Yeah. And are they friendly or are they basically they, walk, walk the other way? Depends. You, you, it's good to avoid them if you can. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And we are joined. Uh, it is our great pleasure to be joined by uh, Chris Dale uh, from the, uh, well, from the great shores of Great Britain. Um, and uh, I was going to say from the e-disclosure information project, but that's much like my entity. That's pretty much you, right, Chris? You are <laughs> the e-disclosure information project? It is indeed. People seem to expect that one has a label, and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I therefore use that. Yes. Um, but as you say, it's more it's more usually me. And you you you've been doing this about as long as I have, right? Like rolling around thirty years or so as a well, as a, uh, about thirty years. Now, late late eighties, I started getting interested in it. Is that thirty yeah. years? I suppose it is. Yeah. Well, um, tell us about that price. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that process. I mean, how did you get sucked into this wonderful world that we call home? Oh, well, that we call e-discovery. Oh, good point. Well, yeah, uh, uh, a, absolutely. This, well, we call we called it discovery back in those days. No e's, of course, but um, uh, we had a rule change subsequently that changed it to disclosure. Uh, ah. I was a litig I was a litigating lawyer. Uh, and we had a big case that involved an awful lot of documents. And I sat to thinking, if this was a supermarket with stuff on shelves or a factory with widgets, there'd be a computer doing this. There must be a computer that does this sort of listing, uh, a system of some kind. And I couldn't find one uh, all the way back then uh, in London anyway. So I bought myself an apricot. Do you remember it, the computer called apricot? I do not. Right before I, before uh, PCs was a, a a funny little thing called an apricot that had green writing going up black screen, <laughs> uh, and a copy of DBase two. Oh, yeah. uh, you probably remember that. Yes, yes. anyway, I do. Um, and I taught myself programming or DBase programming, uh, and built an application for listing documents because in those days before imaging, we all you had to do was list them. I say right. all you had to do; you had to type every one in, uh, so it was a fairly major task. Anyway, um, made some software out of that. We ran a job with it that worked. And, and I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, but that, that suit lawsuit you were involved in, that litigation, how many documents? Uh, do you know, I haven't got a clue. Uh, it would seem trivial now. Um, it was, an, it was the, the, the litigation was about a confirming house, which was a very document heavy business. Uh, and in those days we had to list every document. So I hired a team of roughs to come in and take over a, a boardroom long before this was how one set about doing it. Uh, right. And they typed it all into computers and uh, into PCs, which were then new. And away we went. And as I say, it seemed to work. Um, we lost the litigation, but that's by the way. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, time went on and I did more and gradually thought, right, the world is ready for this. I will come out of law and go into writing software, uh, which was probably about 25 years too early uh, to, to do that. Um, but uh, I teamed up with somebody and we, we uh, developed and marketed the software and did all right. Not great, but we did all right. Um, then various things happened, like uh, companies... Uh, sorry, started... sorry, you, you actually made it available commercially with yeah. the software? Yeah. What, what was it called? It was called Open Law uh, before Open? there was anybody else called Open Law. Uh, okay. And various London firms bought it, which was, which was great. Um, and there was work, ancillary work doing dealing with the data and that sort of thing. Um, and then various happen, things happened, like uh, people started investing very large sums in companies like Ringtail, which was then new. Uh, and we were very, very smartly outclassed by companies with a lot of, of money behind them. Uh, and then I fell out with this bloke uh, that I was working with and we parted company and I went away on holiday not knowing what I was going to do the following Monday but one. Um, and came back and did a fair amount of uh, working of, of data manipulation for law firms where one firm had sent it in a form and another firm wanted it in a different form or that sort of hands on stuff. Right. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, are, we, are we still talking the DOS world here? Are we, have we entered we're, Windows we're, world? We've, we've, moved, we're, we've moved into Windows by now, and we've okay. moved from DBase to Fox Pro. Okay. Um, and uh, at a later stage into Access, um, uh, by which time I'd relinquished the development and taken to the, the marketing and the support and the training and the manual writing and all that sort of thing. Um, which meant that I'd done a bit of everything that had some bearing on developing and selling uh, software. And I started writing, blogs were new then, and I started writing a bit about various themes in discovery and what was interesting. And one late one Saturday night, middle of the night, bloke at EY sent me an email saying, why don't you get this thing sponsored? Uh, which I hadn't thought of. And uh, the following week, I met or I, I came across somebody who was by had been appointed CEO of one of the big US discovery companies. And I'd met him and uh, previously at a conference. And I wrote to him and said, uh, I'm sure you'd like to sponsor what I'm doing. Uh, at which other people in the company said, you did what? You wrote to the CEO? Um, anyway, I just happened to strike a time when they had a webinar the following week and didn't have a clue about English uh, discovery. So I got their sponsorship, which was great. And then others came along, gradually quite a lot of others came along, uh, and which was which was great. So that was a, a funded blog and doing anything else that anybody wanted. And then I thought, before it had started sort of turning into anything, when I was still doing data work, I came to realise that if you weren't in the US, you weren't anywhere on this subject. And we didn't have a bean between us, my wife and I. But we decided that I had to go to legal tech. We scraped up every bit of credit card balance what, we had. What year was this? Mm, 2006, seven. Okay. Like okay. Um, and booked me a flight and a room in the best one of the best hotels in on Sixth Avenue, uh, in order to be there. I uh, stayed so stayed at the Warwick the Warwick, and by the next day I'd met two or three judges. I'd met a few CEOs, uh, and it was great. Legal, legal tech was doing everything legal tech should do, as a place to meet people. And thereafter the sponsorships came in. So that's the sort of the, the short answer to how I came to be doing what I do. Um, we moved later into it into videos and things, but we can come on to that perhaps. So that's that's the answer to the question. How did I get into this? Wow. So so you're saying that networking actually worked. That that's uh... <laughs> networking actually was largely thanks to Jonathan Mars, actually, who was already ah. on the uh, on the scene, as it were, and he introduced me to people. Um, he made sure that I sat next to people at dinners, which was really good of him. Um, and that networking aspect indeed worked. 
being able to yeah. write, well, as indeed had the kickoff in the first place, the, the being able to write to somebody who'd become a CEO and said, hi, you may remember we met at um, whatever, would you like to sponsor what I'm doing? And so that's that was a, a different uh, a different example of networking. I'm not a great networker, I have to say. I'm pretty antisocial on the whole. Uh, and not, very good at, <laughs> not very good at promoting me. Um, but I then spent effectively 15 years or whatever it was promoting other people by... Right effectively by seeking to be objective about them whilst being funded by them, which was uh, an, an interesting uh, line to walk, but it seemed, yeah. it seemed to work, it seemed to work. But how, how do you how do you approach that? Because, um, you know, I mean, pretty much everyone knows that, yes, you know, and you put it straight out there, you are sponsored by <laughs> numerous different companies um, on the blog. But you do write objectively. I mean, you 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 first of all, you get a lot of the scoops and, and early uh, discussions with executives and things like that, and especially when deals are made and, and things like that. But um, the way that you write tends to, you know, obviously you're writing about companies that that uh, that are sponsoring you. You're also writing about companies that aren't sponsoring you at times. But how do you? manage that objectivity how do you manage to to you know when there's something that you have to write that's not necessarily in the best of light but it's someone who who's uh sponsoring you do you do you avoid it do you tackle it anyway how do you talk to those companies if i have to i avoid it um uh, and i don't it's not not the same now i don't have 20 logos down the side of my blog as i did at one point um, they're very, I'm, I'm doing much, much less than I used to do, um, uh, which is largely a function of age um, uh, and not really wanting to do more than uh, it, more than keeps me amused or keeps me in the market. And if you, if you look at my blog now, it's 50 percent relativity and the rest is whatever's caught my eye that's interesting. Um, somebody's lost some documents and it's made it to court or some something like that. <laughs> Uh, right. and less about less about companies. There were very few occasions when things were so embarrassing that I really couldn't face writing about them. The hardest one was when, do you remember when everybody was pitching into Recommind? Yeah. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Over, over the um, uh, Technology Assisted Review, predictive coding. And I had to write, there was no avoiding the subject. Um, but I had to write about it, and that was quite fun. But yeah. that's that's the only time I can remember, and I really enjoyed writing it. It took me three days to write the article, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, I enjoyed were writing you it. To, were you allowed to use the words predictive coding, or did you have to worry about being sued at that point? For, uh... um, no, I, well, I, felt, I felt able to use, I can't remember now what words I used, but um, uh, it was before before there were too many other claims. Right. Um, but anyway, it, it went out all right. They, they, they were sponsors. They didn't mind it. Nobody else attacked me for it. Um, uh, and that's the most you can ask for, really, when uh, in the, 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 the sort of situation that you're talking about, Raki. Uh, if, right. you, if you're going to get, if you're going to have to wade into something like that, the most you can hope for is that nobody, nobody gets too cross with you. Um, right. no, one, no one comes searching for you to, to shoot you down. So. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. without without naming any names, did every anybody ever get really cross with you, or or pull the plug on their sponsorship because of something you wrote? One one lot got very cross with me, but it was after their sponsorship had ended. Ah, and um, so so no financial repercussions. No financial repercussions, but they didn't Good. like what they didn't like what I'd written. Yeah, well, that's very okay. much like me. I mean, uh, I don't take money from anybody, and they're all pissed off at me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the difference, though, is you have a proper job, a real job, whereas that was my job. Uh, uh, yeah, not so much anymore. <laughs> That's since <laughs> COVID. <laughs> well, true. But I didn't do I did very little consultancy uh, uh -huh. over that period because uh -huh. it seemed wrong to take money from people who were providing consultancy services and then competing with them. Right. So I... I, I, it never I bothered me. They didn't mind. The, they didn't mind the reverse of that. <laughs> well, it, bo it bothered me uh, yeah. as well as it taking a lot of time. I didn't have then because there were there was a lot of traveling involved. It's a lot of, lot right. of um, right. going going to events and that sort of thing. And right. I couldn't 
sensibly have taken on a consulting product project. The only ones I took on were ones I reckoned that my sponsors couldn't or wouldn't have done. Gotcha. If they were, if they involved interpretation of rules, for example, they'd probably come and ask me anyway. Uh, right, so I right. might as well just do it. Right. Um, uh, but there weren't very many of those. And in any event, I preferred just writing and turning up on platforms or webinars or whatever and, and talking. And they, right. you can't, one of the things I learned eventually is that you can't say yes to everything. That is true. Um, I want to get back to a point that you made in, in regards to the networking and, and the importance of, you know, legal tech. You said legal tech did what legal tech was supposed to do. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Tom and I had started this chat to begin with was because COVID started and, and we saw, you know, legal tech and those types of things weren't happening. We, we started this when they announced that ILTA wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, I am sure that there are plenty of people out there right now who've got an idea, they want to start something, they, they just need the people to talk to and they yeah. just need to have that presence and, and, you know, find those two judges and three CEOs and, and bounce the ideas off of them and see, you know, what, what happens from there. Um, do you think, and we can address, you know, what, what's available instead of that, but I want to ask a little bit of a different question. Do you think that our industry ha has suffered as an industry due to the lack of that availability? Um, you know, yes, people are doing all these virtual conferences and other things in terms of the education side, but how much do you think it's truly impacted the industry um, by not having those opportunities to get out there and make your name known? It's one of the things that makes that hard is that COVID has brought so many other opportunities that, that don't derive from bumping into people in corridors. Uh, which is effectively what the legal the legal tech networking amounts to, or it used to amount to for me. Right. That's how I got got by. Um, there have been new security implications. There's all sorts of um, COVID-related movements to the cloud, discovery of Zoom um, and similar things or whatever. Uh, I don't know of anybody, anybody good anyway, who's short of work, any providers at the moment. <laughs> Um, of, the, of the big of the big names who are out there, the people who used to be out there doing the networking, um, uh, because the clients need them for something. So that would have been if I if I'd still been out there pitching, then I might have been um, might have suffered from that because ah. people weren't so much interested in chatting about things. They were what they wanted somebody to solve their cloud problem preferably yesterday. Um, but I don't know. Uh, one of the, the the plus for me is that the move to remote um, marketing firstly means people haven't been spending their budgets on going to legal tech. Secondly means that remote is the only way to do it. So that people who are, uh, we very quickly turned from um, traveling everywhere with loads of tripods and lights and cameras. Uh, and shifted to turning my room into a studio with lights and cameras and, and tripods um, uh, with an aim of trying to do nearly as high quality as we uh, from here as we used to do by going there, but missing at the same time um, the bumping into people and the, oh, why don't you come and be in one of my videos, that sort of thing. Uh, whether the industry as a whole, there will be individuals who've suffered, just to come back to your question, I reckon, there'll be individuals who have suffered, who depended utterly on who they met yesterday for what they're going to do tomorrow. Um, uh, the industry's total income, however, I suspect has not much been affected and maybe it's um, bottom line has been improved by not having to spend on conferences. Um, whether that's an important element of cost, I don't know, but certainly um, people who used to send large teams at vast expense to New York or Las Vegas or whatever have presumably been saving uh, a dollar or two uh, right. as, a not, as, as a result yeah. of not going. That's clearly a factor. The, the, the cost savings all around are a big one. I don't think they realized in, in many cases how much that budget came to. You know, yeah. the, 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 
um, at least in the U.S., lawyers are not good business people, and and having a big picture of those sorts of costs hasn't been there. They are getting that big picture now, though. As as I don't know if you've seen the headlines over in in, in your neck of the woods, but the the AMLA 50 are laying people off. They they've realized they don't need all these support people in a high profile, high cost real estate office in Manhattan or the Loop or uh, downtown LA. Um, and so they're taking even more steps to, to cut costs. I'm really, it's one of the reasons I'm going to the live version of ILTA. Well, I'm going to Las Vegas, whether they'll let me into the live version of ILTA is, is, is a whole other story. My yearly struggle to get a press pass. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I'm curious to see how many people have budget to attend that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've been working from home for the last year and you just finally get back to the office and say, hey, I'd like to go to Las Vegas for a week yeah. to attend a right. conference. Some companies I know have no travel budget yeah. for this year. And, and, but I don't know that that's a symptom of hard times. That's a symptom of having realized that there are, there are not having real, not just realizing there are better ways of doing it, but it becoming the norm to do things a different yes. way. I think um, you hit you hit the nail on the head. Ilta's got a real tough problem there, which is they're doing the show virtually, and so a bean counter at a firm in in Manhattan is saying, "I can send you to Las Vegas for a week, or you can attend virtually yeah, from your office." Like, right. yeah, that's that's not even that's not even a discussion. Yeah. It, it shouldn't but, be, but, but yeah. I think it actually still is. Yes, you know, there there are people who who recognize the importance of live events and, and the networking aspect of it. And I do think that you end up with, with people who are pushing to, to go to these things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, ILTA is different, of course, in, in the sense only that it's a user group. It isn't an independent conference the way that Legal Tech New York is um, or purports to be. Um, and and so you know there's a different set of dynamics there i noticed for example that ipro is doing their user conference live they just made the announcement that right. they're going to do it live in san diego in september so we may start to see a little bit of a creep towards some of these shows coming back assuming we don't have a re recurrence of a variant of uh, you know <laughs> co covid covid q comes back by the yeah. end of the summer or something what was really interesting was that right at the beginning of this, I did a webinar with, was it with Ulta? I don't know, with, with one of those organizations, which was all about how to use Zoom and how to work at home and uh, a, a load of things that I was familiar with and everybody else on the panel was familiar with, but which most people weren't. Within, and it was, it was still news, the stuff that we were talking about then. Within right. 10 days, Everybody was doing it, not because of anything we'd said, but because there was no alternative. They had to, right? they had to. Uh, and they just got on with it. And we couldn't possibly have done that uh, webinar 10 days later yeah. because it was it had become the norm. Yeah. Uh, and that was really interesting. I don't know um, what the numbers are now, but Rocky and I did a, 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 a webinar several months ago talking about teams versus some of its competitors. And the numbers, like you said, it was like the retro rockets kicked in. And, and the numbers yeah. just exploded in the COVID era. So, yeah, yeah, it, 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 the question is, will that continue to be the norm? Will the cost savings that are concomitant with that be, continue? Will, 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 again, will the bean counters say, well, just keep doing what you're doing because it doesn't cost me anything? Yeah, yeah, and it, it'll vary from person to person. So for me, I'm very happy just sitting at home, frankly, and talking to the likes of you. Um, uh, as we're doing here, and if occasionally I stumble over a Teams connection that takes a few minutes to work, well, that's nothing compared yeah. to what's in, what was involved in flogging down to Heathrow and waiting for a plane and getting on a plane and you know all the rest of it. Yeah. Yes. And I'll, I'll put up with a certain amount of Zoom or Teams or whatever frustration um, by simply thinking back to how it used to be. Uh, I, I, there are I others... Sure yeah, uh, I I had my decade or you know decade and a half of flying all over the world, and that was great, and that and I liked it at the time. I can't say I'm over sorry 
to have an excuse to, to have had an excuse for the last year and a half. No, I, I agree. From here. I agree. So, I'm hoping our talk of infrastructure will get someplace and we can at least begin to emulate a train system that's similar to what you have. Because I'm always jealous of talking to people from Europe because our train system, as you know, is abysmal. Um, and, uh, you know, if that were an alternative, uh, I do not look forward to going to an airport again, even domestic. No. Yeah. yeah. So, Chris, I, I wanted to um, two topics I wanted to get to uh, today before we, we run out of time. Uh, one, your love of photography and videography. Um, you've mentioned the videos a, a couple of times. And for anyone who doesn't know Chris, it, it, you know, at any of these shows, it was a normal sight to see a working studio, portable studio show up in the lobby or a side room or a hallway of, of any of these conferences with, you know, Chris sitting in, in the spotlight and uh, one of his sons running around with him to, to uh, keep things going. Um, where did that come about? Like where, where did that whole idea and where did your general love of photography, because, you know, I, I see the other, the, the non-legal pictures that you post and things like that, gorgeous stuff. So uh, where, where did all of that come about? The photography forever, and one or two of the pictures okay. I put up last week were from 1967, 1968. So wow. pretty, pretty old pictures. And that's just something that's been interesting. And every so often I take my cameras in and uh, trade them for slightly better ones. So it's never a big hit um, to, to move up to better ones. And I've had the luxury of going to a lot of good places, thanks to thanks to eDiscovery, uh, largely, largely thanks to eDiscovery anyway. Um, and decent kit uh, and I love it and as, as I do less of what I have been doing I spend more time taking photographs and people are nice a, a few people are nice about them and that's, that's great uh, well it make, does make a difference if you're if you have a publication medium like Twitter or whatever and half a dozen people say they like something uh, one would prefer it to be 600 but if it's only six well so bit um, how that went into video was I went to, I started taking one of my sons with me anyway uh, to these events um, because it was a good opportunity to go and see somewhere different or whatever. And we were at, I think at Relativity Fest one year, and my son Will said, you do realize that that Nikon that you use for photographs would operate as a video camera, don't you? And I hadn't really thought about it. Um, didn't, never done any video. So the next year at Legal Tech, we went down to um, B&H on 9th Avenue and bought a couple of tripods and some lights and some recording stuff. Now, let me interject here. Did Will have an interest in video? Why, is this a generational thing? What, what uh, prompted his observation? Uh, he did a, uh, his degree is in uh, st technical stage work. And ah. one of one of the things they did in it was video. Gotcha. So he knew a bit about both the taking of it and the editing, and is quite good at teaching himself what he doesn't know. Right. So he had a, as it were, a dummy to play with in the sense that he he persuaded me to start doing interviews, and that gave him the reason for uh, getting getting more knowledgeable about it. I was able to do something I wouldn't have dreamt of thinking because I had him uh, and gradually we got more and more equipment did more and more of them so that the networking aspect of legal tech the old style sat around in the middle of the lobby and waiting for people to come by which is what I used to love doing at legal tech that all went because we had back-to-back -back appointments for four days doing the videos and we came away with more than 40 one year um, which is which was great um, uh, and eventually I had to start taking two sons. And one year I had to take two sons and a daughter-in-law to carry all the kit. <laughs> and uh, border con uh, you know, the custom, US Customs began to say, you know, what are you doing with all this equipment? Um, so uh, it, it, it turned into quite a big effort. And we still enjoyed doing it and we would have kept doing it, I'm sure. Uh, the last one we were able to do was Relativity Fest of 2019. After which I said, we've got to be able to do nine tenths of this from home. 
what's how can we work out how we can maintain the quality um and by buying a bit more kit redecorating my room that you can see behind me which was uh, very cluttered and dull making it look a bit more studio like uh, and buying a bit more audio kit um I think we've done that. People still seem to like it. The weakness is what other people have got at their end, because it's all very well me being surrounded, as I am here today, by lights and fancy audio stuff and all the rest right. of it. Um, but if the person at the other end is sitting in near darkness with the cheap webcam built into their laptop, um, we're not going to I thought get... I thought you were going to say cell phone. <laughs> well, whatever. We're not going to get the same result as we used to get, but it as yeah. were, won't be our fault. Um, we try and what about bandwidth? People. Is that an issue? I mean, we've not had that as an issue, um, it, but obviously there's a chance at any time with both ends involved. Uh, Will's right. quite Will's quite good at patching audio so that it it comes out That's, all right. And if we have to edit a bit, we edit a bit. Once recently, we had to redo one uh, because of, of a of a load of bandwidth issues. Um, but once re redoing it, they're not difficult to do anyway. The the editing is difficult, but the the setup is tiresome rather than difficult. And if we have to we have to redo it, there's no trouble to us. Maybe trouble for the person at the other end, but it's not a, not a big deal. Right. Um, and it's been a good way. Covid was a coincidence that came along nicely at a time when I was getting slightly fed up with lugging tons of kit all over the place. So not to have to because I couldn't was actually good, right. good timing. I'd like uh, to come and do that with you, but I just can't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I so just have, so happen to have everything set up. That yeah, but I've got a great right. alternative, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely, and it's also cheaper, of course. We, we, don't, yeah. we don't incur the same costs, and therefore don't have to pass on the same costs of doing them. Um, right. We, we're, there's, there's still obviously a cost, but there isn't a cost that includes lugging all that stuff across the Atlantic to get there. So that begs the question, if if legal tech opens up again in, in 2022, will you go? I think probably not, because by 2022, I shall be of an age when I really am not sure that that's Even what I want to do. I don't want to talk to you guys, right? Well, <laughs> uh, if, I can, if I can do it from here. It's too early to say, Tom. Um, I'm not over thrilled at the idea of getting on airplanes for as long as COVID is in the air anyway, uh, right. for as long as we're going to have all the new restrictions that will will flow, and for as long as there's a perfectly sensible alternative way of doing it. So I'm not ruling it out. Um, uh, I'm pleased that Relativity Fest 2021 is virtual. Yeah, did I'm I'm moderating a panel at that uh, without having to flog across to Chicago. Equally, I rather miss Chicago. And I miss yeah. that whole well, sort of yeah. world of uh, the, the, those big events, which I loved. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's no there's no single or simple answer to do you miss it? Would you would you do it if you if the opportunity was there now? I'm not sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've always wondered and, and I think I actually asked this of you uh, a couple of years ago, if if the you know, you've come to, to be the preeminent voice moderator, panelist about cross-border and European e-discovery and, you know, disclosure in the UK and, and anything non-US-based e-discovery. Um, and is that due to, I'm going to say, your accent uh, or, you know, your, your physical location? Um, and or the lack of historically people who could talk to the topics um, and how do you see that changing today in, in terms of, you know, we had Maribeth on on two weeks ago um, talking about, you know, e-discovery in Germany and, and, and clients there. So, you know, obviously there are experts, there are people who who today much more so than five, ten years ago can handle this, but people still look to you as the source of knowledge on, on these things. So. More probably as a moderator than as uh, uh, an expert because of what you've just described, the likes of Maribeth and Jonathan Armstrong and Karen Harty and all sorts of people who um, who weren't doing the talking. They may have been doing the acting, but they weren't doing the talking uh, five, ten years ago. Um, 
it would be presumptuous on my part to say I want to be a panel member talking about how to do this stuff when there's plenty of good men and women out there who do it every day. Now, that wasn't so 10 years ago. Right. So what, what I, the role I like, and I've always liked it anyway, is moderator. Um, keeping the conversation going, zipping from person to person, keeping the themes in the air, but but being able to move on to the next one when it's the right time. I love it. Yes. Um, and I, 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 it. <laughs> you're, you're kind, thank you. Uh, I would do that every once a week if the opportunities came along. Huh. If you go back, though, uh, to 2008, nine when I first went to the US to talk specifically to talk about it, and you'd say to a US audience, uh, in the EU, you are not allowed to, there are restrictions on what you can do with data. And you'd get, it wasn't quite abuse, but you'd get disbelief. Right. Um, Privacy, that doesn't matter. Uh, that doesn't matter, yes. I mean, an American judge has said that this, this data is to go. The American rules say, and you have to say, well, actually, we don't give a toss about American judges yeah. and American rules. Uh, <laughs> uh, our side, we have different considerations and different rules and there is a collision and there's a collision coming that's going to get bigger and for the first couple of years well in first i don't know five years of doing that it was quite fun saying these things and knowing that i was going to meet everything from disbelief to uh not quite abuse but almost uh and i i enjoyed it i thrived on that um the data and you coming out well <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if they if they wanted, you know, I, could, I, I knew I had sources to point to if they if it really got nasty, as it were. And one year we did one at the Masters Conference, uh, and we, they gave us a double slot because it was thought so important. And we decided, and I can't remember who we were then, um, uh, who all of us were. We decided to pitch it quite high because we reckoned that by that time audiences had got more into it. And after about quarter an hour, 20 minutes, somebody put his hand up and said, I don't understand a word you're talking about. What do you mean restrictions <laughs> Restrictions on the use of data? Uh, right. So we had to go back. We, we rewound right to the beginning. We had, unfortunately, they'd given us a double session uh, and, and covered uh, everything, all the, the basics, all the way through. Uh, now, of course, things have changed. The US has its own good reasons uh, for, uh, for bringing privacy and data protection. Uh, into it um, and has come to accept it. And it's a challenge. People are, the last webinar I did, um, which was for relativity, the panel members were all saying GDPR has been great for us, for business, for the how, for how handled, how data is handled, um, for uh, encouraging people to think sensibly about uh, information retention and all the rest of it. Uh, which is not what you would have expected to hear three years ago, back in 2018, when everybody was still abusing it. Um, right. And I didn't care whether people abused it or not. It was the law and it didn't matter uh, if the people didn't like it. They could had to lump it. Um, it's rather better when people are now um, in tune with the idea and willing to talk about how we can exploit this for for better. And it was that that uh, the, the webinar, uh, the Relativity International panel that I did uh, a month ago was a turning point for me in the sense that every member of the panel was positive about uh, the effect that GDPR had had on their business and right. how people had were now working for the better um, uh, in finding a way between reconciling the needs of uh, the litigation or, or regulation or you know, whatever the whatever the discovery cause was so, uh, cause with, the, with the restrictions. Correct. So that's cool. Now, Tom, um, unfortunately, we are coming up on time, so I'm going to ask you to take it away with our final question. Our final question. OK, well, actually, I, I have a new preliminary final question. Uh, a preliminary uh, final question. Chris, which is yes. a very short one, though. Uh, Beatles or Stones? Sorry? The Beatles uh, or the Rolling Stones? Uh, Beatles. Uh, I just can't get any respect from my audience here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the final question, as always, is if you could spend a day with anybody from our profession, 
living or dead. It doesn't have to be somebody who's alive currently. Uh, doing anything you want. It doesn't have to be an e-discovery thing or even a legal thing. It could be wandering the countryside of England and taking pictures and having a good lunch or, um, um, you know, perhaps taking a 14-hour plane flight to Dubai or wherever. <laughs> Something you really enjoy doing. Who, who would it be and what would you do with them? It would undoubtedly be Browning Marin, um, whom I miss dreadfully, as I know you do. Yeah. He and I went to a lot of places. We went, uh, we, were, we were in Australia and we were in Hong Kong and Singapore and as well as the US. And it was always one of the big pleasures uh, meeting up with him when I got there. And going to finding restaurants, which were not, never necessarily the finest restaurants in town. They were well chosen ones. Um, I remember once in Sydney, we were, we'd been before and we were there again and we were trying to find a restaurant and he sort of sniffed the air a bit and he said, that way. And we plunged through some shopping centre and there indeed was the restaurant that we'd been to uh, the previous year or two years before or whatever. Um, and he was, he was uh, as you know, he was great company. Yeah. Uh, as well as immensely knowledgeable. Uh, he was also very good to me. Uh, he gave me openings in the early days, uh, which I didn't necessarily see as openings at the time. It was only afterwards that I realised um, that that's what he was doing for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, I miss him dreadfully. I still miss him. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, Chris, thanks for... Uh... Thanks for your time. I, 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 I pause there just because I, 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 I come to think that we may never see each other in person again. Well, I fear that's that is right. And it disturbs yeah. me. Yeah, um, that that's that. Might but I, right. I was talking to somebody last night uh, uh, about uh, the upcoming ILSA conference and they weren't going. And one of my Canadian uh, contacts and she said, well, I, you know, I don't even have, like you said, I don't have to consider whether I'm going to go or not because I can't get into your country. So, you know, it yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to go if I have to, you know, get there and then quarantine for 14 days. And that, that, that's that's a non-starter. But um, she said, you know, uh, and, I, and I literally said, you know, I, I question whether I'll ever go to New York City again. Um, yeah. You know, I'm at the same age where it's just like, you know, there's the, not only the health concerns and the travel concerns, but there's the <laughs> do I really care concern. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's places yeah. I want to go to one more time, you know, uh, before the final curtain falls. And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, the, there's, you know, places in, in this country for sure that I want to see again. And I'm not sure New York registers high on that list. Yeah. Um, just a one closing thought on that. Those of us who went through the years of going to events and who are used to this and who met each other and uh, yes. had meals together and sat on panels together, um, we have a different experience to those who come after, uh, those who don't have the ability of having bumped into each other, uh, the, yep. the, 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 the opportunities in the past of bumping into each other at events and who can just pick up on a video call like it was bumping you were bumping into them in a restaurant or a corridor right and uh, i'm not saying that's impossible it's just that it'll be a very different experience yep yep things yep. of what, 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 what's what's the line by yates yates had a line about change didn't he things have changed changed utterly um and uh, uh yeah it's in the widening jar and um yeah that's just yeah it's that but that's the nature of life right well, I feel lucky that I had those experiences and and was able to take part in some of those those lobby meetings. Rocky and I and his brother are uh, notorious for going to a local cigar shop about a block or two from the the hotel in New York, and yep. that started to morph into a big, you know, informal <laughs> meeting of people yeah. just sitting around shooting the breeze. So, yeah, it, 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 as someone once said, uh, after after Gail passed away, don't don't. Uh, don't cry because it's it's gone. You know, laugh because it happened. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and that's it. We've got some great memories of those days and the seminal days, right? The early days of, yes. of our profession, um, which uh, were also exciting just for that very reason. Like, Indeed, they were. Yeah. yeah. So, thanks so much for your time. I I hope that we will see each other someplace we'll down the road in person. 
So but, do uh, I, Tom. If not, please be well. And Rocky, I know we're going to see each other someplace if, uh, you know, because yeah, Baltimore, <laughs> Baltimore calls to me. You know, that yes. you know, we will we will meet each other. You, I'm sure you're right. What, what's the saying in in Israel to a to a is it to a death in Jerusalem? Is that the saying? Well, there's a saying about returning to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, I'm not planning on dying in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, well, I, maybe it's maybe it's amongst people over here who say, you know, may you return to the homeland, that sort of thing. But I always. I always say, well, you know, I, I want one more trip to Baltimore. Come on, you know, Charm yeah, City yeah. calls to me. So. Hmm. <laughs> okay. so thanks very much, people. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you all again next time on the eDiscovery Channel. And thank you for asking yes. me.